It would help with that. I'm sorry. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on the dependence on foreign adversaries, America's critical mineral crisis. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, and the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, be allowed to sit with the subcommittee and participate in the hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at the hearing are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. I therefore ask unanimous assent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted in accordance with the committee rule 3-0. Without objection, so ordered. Good morning, and welcome to this important hearing titled Dependence on Foreign Adversaries, America's Critical Mineral Crisis. I am honored to be the chairman of the House Natural Resources Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, joined by our vice chairman, Mike Collins, our, our colleague, and distinguished guests and experts. I also congratulate ranking member Stansbury on her new role. Uh, being a neighbor from New Mexico, uh, it's kind of a fitting title. This subcommittee is excited to get back to work. Today we will examine the dependence of the United States on foreign adversaries for critical minerals, a dependence that undermines our national sovereignty, our economic prosperity, and our technological innovation. We will explore the current state of our critical mineral supply chain and the actions we must take to empower our national security and to unleash America's energy and mineral potential. This is an urgent matter as we rely on critical minerals for our way of life, from smartphones and laptops to renewable energy technology to medical equipment, military gear, energy storage, defense systems, and many essential aspects of modern life and natural security that depend on an abundance of critical minerals. The United States must lead in the production of these minerals and reduce our dependence on nations that do not share our values, interests, or our high environmental standards. By promoting the development of domestic minerals and streamlining the permitting process, we can create jobs here in America, increase economic growth, and enhance our energy and national security. Minerals are particularly essential for battery storage, and a, a lack of sufficient battery storage and transmission capacity means renewable resources can't be stored in large quantities like coal or natural gas. Without reliable conventional energy sources, communities are subject to roll rolling blackouts, endangering the health and safety of our local communities. We cannot afford to be dependent on foreign nations to power America. I say again, our country has a dangerous reliance on foreign nations for energy and critical minerals. Recycling plays an important role, but demand requires American mining as well. Additionally, there is a case for climate optimism. It's called American innovation. So let's, everyone here wants to maintain healthy lands and waters, especially many of my Republican colleagues who live in rural areas. Sadly and concerningly, most of our critical minerals come from foreign countries, particularly China, despite there being an abundance of valuable materials we could source here at home. Unfortunately, permitting a, permitting a new hard rock mine in the United States can take more than a decade. Our unpredictable and un overburdening regulatory framework pushes investment abroad, where environmental and labor standards are not nearly as stringent as our own. Promoting responsible, renewable American energy development requires domestic hard rock mining to avoid supply chain disruptions and to reduce our import, import reliance on unfriendly nations. This hearing is an opportunity to have a constructive conversation about the challenges we face and the solutions we can implement to meet these challenges. So let's work together with the common goal of unlocking the full potential of our country to secure a brighter future for all Americans. Together we can balance our national security and environmental goals. Overregulation, even if well intended, will simply lead to more production in that adversarial nations with few, if any, labor or environmental standards. I welcome our new members and appreciate the important work we will do together. I also welcome and thank our guests for joining. Thank you all for joining us today. I now rank, uh, recognize the ranking member for any statement she may have. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Gosar, Chairman. Uh, it's an honor to be able to serve alongside you, and welcome to our first subcommittee of oversight. 
It's uh, with great joy that I am able to serve as the ranking member. I want to thank our witnesses and guests today and of course all of our members who are here for the first time today. I'm Melanie Stansbury and I represent New Mexico's first congressional district which is right in the heart of central New Mexico. It's a vast rural district that includes Albuquerque and many of the surrounding rural and tribal communities um, which are greatly affected by the work of the agencies that this committee and subcommittee have jurisdiction over. These issues that we cover in the Natural Resources Committee at large and especially the oversight that we do in this committee are of great personal concern to me and to the communities that I represent, not only because of the significance of the beauty and public lands and waters that are within my district and the tribal communities that I help to represent and collaborate with, but also because I myself am a science professional who's worked in natural resources for more than 20 years. I've worked in water resources and drought management since the beginning of my career and worked on the counterpart of this committee in the Senate Energy Committee for number of years and in the Office of Management and Budget. In fact, during my time working in the Office of Management and Budget, I was actually the budget and policy analyst who oversaw the budget for the Bureau, uh, the US um, GS, and uh, the critical minerals issues that we are talking about today. So this is actually a topic that I have worked on for many years, including during my time in uh, the Senate Energy Committee where I also worked on critical minerals um, uh, issues in a bipartisan manner with my counterparts on the committee. So the issues that we're going to discuss today are near and dear to my heart. Of course, they are of national strategic importance. But before I dive into that, I just want to take a moment since we are beginning the subcommittee's work to talk about some of the priorities that we're hoping to work on over the course of this Congress. And I hope um, and am optimistic that we will find opportunities for bipartisan collaboration, not only for policies to advance the needs of the American people that we represent, but also to um, conduct appropriate oversight and to root out waste, fraud, and abuse, which of course is our role here on the Oversight Committee. Um, among the many issues that this committee will take up and which we are hoping to prioritize in our oversight and policy role are issues around the climate and clean energy transition and in particular helping to empower our communities so that they can determine their own economic futures in the process. New Mexico is an energy rich state of all forms of energy and as we are making this transition to a clean energy future it is absolutely critical that our workers, our unions, our communities have a strong voice in every aspect of how we plan those local, regional and national economies. It's also crucial that we develop the workforces that help to support the development of those industries and to help transition those who are uh, going to see new opportunities as we build out a climate resilient grid and energy future. In addition to that, obviously, this committee has broad jurisdiction over public lands, forests, and waters. Uh, and to the extent that the oversight committee takes up uh, issues on uh, takes up issues surrounding those, we'll be working on those issues as well, as well as upholding our responsibilities to our tribes. So uh, the issue that we're here to talk about today, of course, is critical minerals. And as we know, critical minerals, and as the chairman discussed, are crucial to the future of the United States. Uh, up until the 1990s, the U.S. was a net exporter of rare earth minerals and due to trade policies that uh, began obviously in the 1980s and extended into the 1990s, American mining companies were no longer able to compete due to global prices. And as a result of that, we saw the rise in especially Chinese investment in mining, not only in China, but across the world. Recent efforts by the Chinese government to stockpile and to restrict the trade of these elements have put the United States and other global um, countries at risk 
For the United States, this is a national security issue. This is an issue that affects every aspect of our economy as we are completely dependent, every single one of us, on these electronics that run our lives these days and every aspect of our lives. So the question before us is how do we responsibly develop our critical minerals supply chain through recycling, reuse, innovation, international trade relationships, um, and making the best and most appropriate use of existing resources in the United States. Let me be clear, we cannot mine and permit our way out of this problem. There may be mining solutions that may be a part of what we have to do, but that is not the sole solution to addressing our critical minerals and national security shortage. So I look forward to working with the chairman and with that, I yield back. I thank the general lady. I now recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Westerman, for any statement. Thank you, Chairman Gosar, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first um, subcommittee hearing for the 118th Congress, and it's very fitting that this hearing be with the uh, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. I've, as I've said before, I think the purpose of this committee and, and the whole committee is to shine light, discover truth, and make changes as are needed. And this committee is where much of that light shining will take place. Uh, oversight should be a bipartisan effort by, the, uh, by Congress to exercise our constitutional duty to for have checks and balances over an administration. And I, I believe that's true whether, uh, regardless of who the majority, the minority party is in the Congress or who uh, sits at the Oval Office. I do want to offer my congratulations to Chairman Gosar and Ranking Member Sansbury. Uh, you have an important role here and I look forward to your leadership and the, uh, the work of this subcommittee and appreciate the opening statements of both the Chairman and the Ranking Member. And I think with, with that attitude, we should be able to do the work of the committee. And uh, I would add to what Ms. Stansberry said that we can't mine and permit our way out of this. Um, actually, we would have to permit and then mine, uh, but it's permit, mine, refine, and manufacture. We have to create those supply chains that allow us to compete with the, it's, it's basically with the Chinese Communist Party. It's with Vladimir Putin and Russia. And it's a lot of bad actors around the world that are supplying the ingredients that go, go into these phones and other devices. Um, in the last Congress, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed and there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars to build uh, green energy systems. And all of those green energy systems are reliant on mining. It comes back to, to mining and then the processes that take place after that. So we have been blessed with energy and minerals here in the, the U.S. Both the chairman and the ranking member come from states that are uh, abundantly blessed with energy and minerals. And they're in the, you know, the, the, the focus of where a lot of these policies need to be addressed, as well as my friend Mr. Stauber from Minnesota. So at the same time, Congress um, passed a law to spend billions of dollars on electrifying our economy. Uh, we're also seeing actions from the administration to shut down mining. And those two things really don't go hand in hand. They're competing interests and they make the problem even worse. You know, we talked in the, the hearing yesterday about some of these issues and the fact that uh, the World Bank says we need to mine as much copper in the next 20 to 25 years as has been mined in the history of the world. That is a, that is a big challenge. If you just focused every effort that we had to do that, it would be, still be hard to meet those challenges. Uh, we need to do more recycling, but there's no way you can, there's not enough to recycle to even come close to meet the demands that we have. Uh, when you look at the critical minerals list and you look at where those critical minerals are being supplied from, um, I, honestly, we should be embarrassed that we're so far down the list when we've been blessed with deposits of those critical minerals here in the U.S. And if we develop those minerals here and develop the other parts of the, uh, of the supply chain, then that means generating huge amounts of wealth for the U.S., for U.S. workers, for great jobs in rural communities. Um, I live in a, in a rural community and 
think just about everybody on this dais lives in a, an area that's either rural or close to a rural community, and we know how important these, uh, these jobs are to the local economies. And we can do it cleaner and safer and with less human rights uh, violations, with actually I'll say with no human rights violations. And the, the situation we're in right now is these pictures behind me depict um, cobalt is, is Congolese cobalt, and it's coming from mines with child slave labor. And we have to be uh, realistic and understand what's happening. As we pour more money into an electrified economy, we're increasing the, the, the labor participation rate in Congo with forced labor, with child slave labor, and uh, people forced to do jobs at, you know, for as little as $2 a day or less. So those are the challenges we face with oversight. I look forward to the hearing. I look forward to additional hearings. And then I really look forward to taking what we learn from these hearings, um, putting it into substantive legislation, or else informing the Appropriations Committee um, what needs to happen on funding for these federal agencies that are failing to do their job. And with that, Chairman, I yield back. That silly little button. Um, the ranking member is on his way, so when he gets here, um, uh, we'll go back to him once uh, we we'll start with our, our witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. Nick Loris, the Vice President of Public Policy, C3 Solutions from Arlington, Virginia. Our second witness is Dr. Michael Motes, Professor of the Department of Materials and Science and Engineering, Missouri University of Science and Technology, Rolla, Missouri. Mr. Aaron Minces, Senior Policy Counsel of Earthworks, Baltimore, Maryland. I now yield to Representative Pete Stauber for 30 seconds to introduce our final witness, Mr. Jason George, Business Manager for the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I, today I have the pleasure of introducing my friend Jason George. Jason serves as a business manager and financial secretary of the Operating Engineers Local 49, or 49ers as they're known in Minnesota, North and South Dakota. There are a few people that have the insight and leadership of Jason. Our 49ers span Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, operating the heavy equipment and doing plant management at facilities across the upper Midwest. Whatever the project may be, you're likely to find one of Jason's 49 members putting in the hard work to build the infrastructure. Thank you, Jason, and I look forward to your testimony today. So let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. To begin your testimony, please press the talk button on the microphone. We use timing lights here. When you begin, the light will turn green. When you have one minute left, it will turn yellow. And at the end of five minutes, it will turn red. And I will ask you to please complete your statement very shortly there. I will also allow all witnesses to testify before member questioning. The chair now recognizes Mr. Loris for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Gosar, Ranking Member Stansberry, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Nick Loris, and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for C3 Solutions, which stands for the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. With my time, I'd like to make three brief points. First, the importance of critical minerals for the economy and the requirements necessary to meet clean energy demands. Second, the adverse environmental and social impacts from mining and processing critical minerals in certain places abroad. And third, exploring opportunities to capitalize on domestic mineral abundance, to diversify the market, and to reduce dependence on foreign adversaries. First, non-fuel critical minerals are essential for our quality of life technological progress, national security, and environmental ambitions. Critical minerals are the foundation that empowers companies to build, manufacture, and innovate, and they are the foundation for the products that keep Americans and people around the world safe, healthy, and happy. Critical minerals are also necessary for renewable and clean energy technologies. Most low carbon and zero emissions technologies require a moderate or high amount of at least two critical minerals and several sources, including wind, batteries, and hydrogen, have moderate to high needs for four or more critical minerals. Significant increases in critical mineral supplies will be necessary to address climate change. 
To meet the International Energy Agency's global net zero targets by 2050, the agency estimates the world will need 43 million metric tons of critical minerals, a six-fold increase from 2020 levels. Granted, we need to take uh, those estimates with a, a, a large grain of humility, but even under much less ambitious scenarios, it is almost certain that future critical mineral needs will be substantial. And to be clear, the massive critical mineral requirements are not by itself a reason to be pessimistic about the future of clean energy. Instead, policymakers must recognize the importance of these minerals, the realities of future demand, and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Secondly, addressing the human rights abuses of critical mineral development and processing in certain countries will be essential for having socially just growth in clean energy and electric vehicles and for the continued use of modern technologies. The Democratic Republic of the Congo supplies nearly 75% of the world's cobalt and the mining practices are appalling to say the least. Having visited and researched the practices, Harvard fellow Siddharth Kara has extensively documented the horrors and abuses of artisanal mining in the DRC, where tens of thousands of child laborers are digging the cobalt out by hand while breathing in toxic fumes and dust. Chinese ownership of most of these mines and Chinese dominance of cobalt refining exacerbate the supply chain concerns. And, and speaking of China, the human rights exploitations of the Uyghur Muslim minorities and other Muslim minorities in the Xinjiang region of China has also been well documented and is extremely concerning. A recent Breakthrough Institute report estimates that 42% of the global solar grade polysilicon production capacity was in that region in the year 2021. In addition to the egregious human rights tragedies, there are also economic and environmental concerns of over-reliance on China for minerals and processing. Poor environmental standards and weak enforcement in China have resulted in contaminated groundwater and soil and dangerous levels of air pollution. Encouragingly, the rare earth market is diversifying worldwide to some extent, which will reduce the dependence on China and promote more environmentally friendly ways to mine and process rare earths, which brings me to my third point. Congress must continue to work with the private sector to open opportunities to capitalize on resource abundance, diversify supply chains, promote ethical mineral sourcing, and develop market alternatives. For instance, modernizing permitting processes should put America on par with countries like Canada and Australia that unlock mineral deposits while maintaining rigorous environmental safeguards. The more the US and other developed countries extract their resources, the fewer minerals we will need to import from countries that have lax environmental standards and use morally unconscionable labor practices. At a bare minimum, agencies should, agencies should conduct an environmental review rather than place a mining area off limits before any such review is even conducted. Further, Congress should continue to support research and development for critical minerals recycling, mining, and processing innovations. Collaboration among government labs, research universities, and the private sector could help unlock breakthrough technologies, improve efficiencies, and generate market viable alternatives. With any subsidies, Congress should also maintain policy neutrality. To the extent that the government provides any subsidies, technology neutrality will generate more efficient outcomes. In conclusion, rising prices for mineral, com mineral commodities could slow the deployment of clean energy technologies moving forward. Alternatively, rising prices could be an opportunity and should be the signal for markets to act, to increase supplies, to develop substitutes, to secure supply chains, diversify away from unethically sourced minerals, and reduce dependence on foreign adversaries where environmental standards are poor. Congress can act by removing the barriers that prevent the private sector from providing clean, reliable energy choices at lower prices. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Loris. We've been joined by the ranking member for the full committee. He is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, other than to uh, uh, congratulate you and the ranking member and the positions, a uh, very important committee, and, uh, and associate myself with the ranking member's opening remarks. I think she said it much better than I could. And to just put into put in the hopper that I don't think we can look at this regulatory side and permitting side in terms of what we, needs to be done there re relative to mining and critical minerals without overlapping on that uh, 1872 mining law, uh, which many of, many of the controversies that are occurring not only in my state but across the country are in relationship to how that that law. Uh, is not working for these times. With that, let me yield back and, and thank you very much. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The chair now recognizes Dr. Motes for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Gosmer, Ranking Member Stansberry, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today on this important topic related to critical minerals. My name is Mike Motes, and I'm a professor of metallurgical engineering, the chair of material science and engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. I have 30 years of experience as an extractive metallurgist. I've worked with many of the mining companies and metal producers in our, in our country and abroad. And I offer you my experience and my, op my observations from how to actually produce metals. As you know, critical minerals are very important to modern lives. We've already talked about the importance of what it is in the cell phone. We often focus on the battery minerals and the rare earths, but if you don't have gallium, you don't have Wi-Fi. If you don't have indium, you don't have the touch screen. If you don't have tellurium, you don't have your solar panels. There's a lot more to it than just the battery minerals and the rare earths that are often talked about in the news. USGS produced their updated list in 2022. There are 50 critical minerals. We use 87 elements on the periodic table for manufacturing. 50 of them are on the critical mineral list. This shows you the dire straits that our country is facing because of our lack of production. I appreciate Ranking Member Stanberry's comments this morning because over my career, over my lifetime, I've watched the United States decline. We were once a metal mining powerhouse, and now we do not. I work with a lot of mining companies, and I've watched smelters and refineries close down and we need to reverse course. Over the last 30 years, China has built 40 copper smelters. They will build another four in the next few years, and this is only to meet internal demand. They now produce 11 million tons of copper every year. The United States produces two. If you produce the copper, if you refine the copper, you control the tellurium. Many of our critical minerals are byproducts. If you control the zinc production, you control the germanium, which is needed for integrated circuits for satellites, and the indium. If you control the aluminum, which they now control 40% of the world's production, and they produce over 40 million tons of aluminum, relative to our less than 1 million, you control gallium. It's not even on the critical mineral list, but steel production is essential for all of modern life. We produce about 82 million tons in the United States. Over two thirds of that comes from recycling. The Chinese now produce 990 million tons of steel every year. That's enough to produce 14,000 Nimitz class aircraft carriers every year. Not all, all, not all steel goes into aircraft carriers. What I am very concerned about is the fact that all of those plants that produce lead, zinc, copper, steel, that are not on our critical mineral list, some are, they're going to come out of their country. And when they do that, they're going to flood the world. And are we as a country going to do things to protect the plants that we need to produce the raw materials for our feedstocks? As we look at what has happened around the world, our plants, our mines, our facilities have declined and the companies are trying the best they can. And again, as Ranking Member Stansmary, I think you had an excellent comments. They're just not economical. Why? Because other countries are not playing on the same playing field as we are. We need to level the playing field for our, for our corporations to make money and do the right thing. And they will. I work with many of them. They are on the cutting forefront of environmental responsibility. They live in the same communities that they, they produce in, and they want to do the right things. It's just hard to make money in this environment. So with that, I'd also like to point out that if you're going to build these plants, if you're going to build these mines, if you're going to build these recycling facilities, you need the workforce. Just like the plants have been under, um, underfunded, so have the universities and so have the community colleges. We need not only really talented engineers, which of course I'd be happy to produce for you, but we also need the tradesmen. I can tell you that most plants and most mines are mostly concerned about who's going to run the haul truck, who's going to put the pipe on, who's going to do the welding. We need to focus on the trades as well as the engineers who are going to develop all of these things that you want to innovate. We need to look at how to create, create more value out of our existing operations in the short term while looking at new deposits and new opportunities to expand our, our production of these critical minerals and all minerals and all metals in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Motes. The chair now uh, uh, recognizes Mr. Minces for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Gosar, Ranking Member Stansbury, 
uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on reducing America's dependence on irresponsibly sourced minerals. My name is Aaron Minces. I'm with Earthworks, the nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting communities and the environment from mineral impacts while supporting the just, equitable, and rapid transition to renewable energy. I'd like to just adopt the uh, Westerman Stansberry approach um, about uh, we can't permit or mine our way out of this crisis. Improving mineral supply chains means fixing the weaker links. The common misconception is that mining is the weaker link. Instead, we need to build stronger links of circular economy infrastructure in the midstream and end-of-life management for battery materials, cell phone materials as well. The best way to meet this demand is to vest in facilities and methods to recycle, refurbish, reuse, and substitute the minerals we already have. The President's Supply Chain Executive Order, the Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act are making important strides toward opening access to recycled materials and reducing our dependence on mine minerals. Currently, the circular economies from mostly allied nations produce and help supply the markets for recycled materials. The United States remains years behind Asia's and Europe's circular economy infrastructure. Last month, the European Union finalized their battery directive. Soon, batteries in the EU will come with a traceable QR code, known as a battery passport, uh, recycled content requirements, producer responsibility, and supply chain due diligence. Research indicates that with the right policies in place like these, we can create a more circular economy that may approximately have global demand for certain mined minerals like cobalt, lithium, nickel, key to the clean energy transition. Even greater reductions, up to 90% for lithium, are achievable through investments in mass transit and better battery design. As the market for secondary use of these materials matures, this further reduces the pressure to source from new mines. Government procurement, consumer pressure both play important roles in driving innovation, driving incentives toward more responsible material sourcing. Major consumers, including automakers and electric electronics companies, have directed their suppliers to source more responsibly by committing to the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, or IRMA, which independently audits and certifies environmental and social performance at mines. <coughs> we acknowledge <clears throat> the importance of supply chain security in certain minerals. However, we challenge the notion that our public lands agencies could or even should resolve the geopolitics of the highly specialized internationally traded commodities. While domestic mines will source some raw materials, the task of managing supply chains has almost nothing to do with mining. Congress designated that task to the agencies of the Critical Minerals Consortium with well-established tools for managing that task. Those include authorities to stockpile minerals, impose trade restrictions, negotiate agreements, promote research, development workforces, discover alternatives. They blend tradecraft and statecraft with engineering, R&D, all to reduce risk of supply disruptions and improve environmental outcomes. As the U.S. government pursues these strategies, we urge agencies to require operators perform due diligence across their supply chains in accordance with internationally accepted standards. In particular, we call on the Biden administration to uphold indigenous people's rights to self-determination and right to free, prior, and informed consent. No solution is perfect. Even with more robust material reuse and collection, new hard rock mines on public lands will provide materials. However, mining public lands under a law explicitly designed for settler colonialism only furthers environmental injustice and puts an equitable transition out of reach. Legislative and regulatory reform can create more responsible domestic mining policies that put protections for communities at the forefront. In conclusion, Earthworks strongly supports immediately transitioning to a just, justly sourced renewable energy economy to prevent further disruption from the climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Menzies. I now recognize Mr. George for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members. I want to thank my friend, Congressman Stauber, for the introduction as well. Uh, there's no uh, greater champion for workers uh, in their district than, than my friend uh, Pete, and thank you for that. Uh, my name is Jason George. I'm the elected leader of the Minnesota's largest construction union, the Operating Engineers Local 49. Our members operate and repair the heavy equipment that builds every aspect of our region. Uh, you know, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss this very serious issue facing our nation and members I represent. The mining of critical minerals, specifically where they are mined, will have a profound impact on our collective future. I was born, raised, and currently live in Minnesota. The vast majority of our nearly 15,000 members live and work in Minnesota. Our state has a long, proud history of mining. We like to remind people that our state mined the ore that produced the steel that won two world wars. The mining industry has been and has been and remains the lifeblood of northern Minnesota. Today, we are at a precipice of a generational opportunity that could launch another hundred years of prosperity through mining. Our nation and the world are in desperate need of critical minerals such as nickel, cobalt, and copper. These minerals are necessary to build the batteries, wind turbines, solar panels, and other products the world needs in order to transition to a clean energy economy. 95% of our domestic nickel resources, a vast majority of our cobalt, and about a third of our copper deposits are beneath the ground in northern Minnesota. The only question before us whether, is whether or not we will be allowed to mine them. And that really is the only question, whether we will be allowed to do this or not. The, there really is no debate about whether we can. We've been doing it for 100 years or more. Uh, we have the technological know-how to extract these minerals safely. The people who live near the potential mines want the opportunity. Uh, I don't believe, and Congressman Stauber can correct me, that there's an elected body anywhere where these minerals are located that does not support these projects being explored. Not one. They all support it. Everyone who lives there wants this opportunity. It's people that don't live there that are preventing that. What we also don't have is a fair process for permitting mines that is based on science and reason, from my experience. Instead, we have a hyper-political process that has been hijacked by a combination of wealthy cabin owners, wealthy tourists, business owners who supply their outfitting needs, and anti-development extremists. This small group of people is highly influential within the Democratic Party structure in my home state. They are loud, they give a lot of money, and too many Democrats in my area, in my state, uh, inclu uh, are, are advancing their own narrow political agenda at the expense of Minnesota and the American people, in my opinion. The latest example is a decision by the Department of the Interior to ban mining on more than 225,000 acres of northern Minnesota land that contain the vast majority of our, net of our mineral resources. The department did so without studying any specific mine plan. It's purely based on hypothetical scenarios uh, and not specific data. It's, it issued a blanket ban based on hypothetical scenarios. The decision had nothing to do with science and everything to do with democratic politics, in my opinion. Too much is at stake to allow this to happen. Good paying union jobs are on the line. Members of my union and others will build these projects, earn family sustaining wages, world class health care and pensions that ensure a dignity of good life and retirement. Unlike the data used to ban mining, these, these jobs aren't hypotheticals. Like any good union representative and union leader, we have it in writing. We have project labor agreements with all the mining companies that are proposing mines in this area. They will be built by my members, and they will be good paying jobs, and we have it in writing. You know, as a labor leader, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out also what happens if we don't mine it in Minnesota. And you see the pictures behind uh, the, the gentleman up there about where these products and where these minerals will be mined if we don't do it here. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, I will just sum up by you know, saying that we are extremely frustrated back home. Uh, we, we know how to do this. We have the minerals in our backyard. The people that live there want to these jobs and want to explore these opportunities. We absolutely have the know-how to do it safely. The cleanest water in Minnesota exists where mines have exist for more than 100 years. 
the the dirtiest water in Minnesota exists where the in the districts where the people that are trying to stop us from mining in the Twin Cities, and that's a fact. And that is something that is extremely frustrating to everybody that I represent, and most people in Minnesota, especially the people that are trying to to have raised families and have uh, these good paying job opportunities in northern Minnesota. So I thank you for your time, and I'll end with that. Thank you, Mr. George. It's always great to have somebody coming from the ground level to give us some reality checks. I'm now going to recognize members for five minutes. We're going to go to Mr. Lamborn first this morning. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Gosar, for having this meeting. Thank you for the witnesses for being here. And besides being on Natural Resources, Representative Gosar, I'm also on the Armed Services Committee. So I'm going to ask questions that have to do with both of the committees. In other words, the connection between critical minerals and national security. And that's something I think we should all be aware of. The balloon incident with China shows us that there are countries out there that are uh, not seeking to really help us out. And so Dr. Motes, that leads to my first question. Um, what country or countries does the U.S. source many of its critical minerals from? Thank you, gentlemen. Um, of course, the answer for all metallurgical answers, it depends. <clears throat> so many of the, like the rare earths for the magnets, uh, mostly come out of China. Yeah. The nickel and cobalt is mined. Uh, cobalt is mostly mined in Central Africa and then processed in, in China to, to make the, the lithium ion batteries that we need. There are other elements that come from allied countries. Uh, like aluminum mostly comes from the aluminum valley in Quebec. Uh, and so that's probably, uh, you know, a, a okay thing from a geopolitical standpoint. So it's a very broad answer to a, to a question. Um, I'm going to probe a little more on the China connection. Uh, we know that uh, China supplies 26 different minerals, of which the U.S. is over 50 percent import reliant. That's far more than from any other country. And some of those minerals, the U.S. is 100 percent reliant on China. So what implications does this have on our national security when a country like China, who is, uh, I won't go into all the, the threats that they're posing to our national security, but what's the, what's, does our dependence do to our national security? So one of the critical minerals is tellurium. Tellurium is added with bismuth to make. Uh, could you speak into the microphone a little better? Sure. Cool. Tellurium comes from copper refining. China dominates chopper, copper refining. So most of the tellurium in the world comes out of China. From a military standpoint, uh, um, tellurium is mixed with bismuth to make uh, thermal electric night vision materials. So whoever controls the tellurium, uh, we do produce some tellurium in the United States, but it's exported and then refined and brought back into the United States. But right now, the tellurium that's needed for night vision goggles and for solar panels, over 50% of the so grid, grid storage solar panel uses cadmium telluride, and we're heavily dependent on China for that. And yeah, thank you for uh, focusing on those uh, military applications. There are tremendous economic applications. The ranking member talked about cell phones, things like that, computers. We know that there are chip making. There are tremendous needs there for critical minerals that only come out of China, either mining or refining. Um, how can the U.S. increase its national security, though, by securing new materials higher up in the supply chain? What, what should we do to make our situation not so precarious? In the short term, I think we need to look at every mine and every processing plant that's here currently in the United States, and we need to look at where, where can we get critical minerals that we're already processing. And we're working at that at our university. I personally work with companies looking at evaluating where they can get <clears throat> gallium, which is important for Wi-Fi and all the semiconductor chips that we have. Uh, gallium right now could be, at least a large chunk of it could come out of our two zinc plants in Tennessee and North Carolina, specifically the one in Tennessee. Currently, gallium is not recovered. Uh, the germanium is shipped to Europe for refining and brought back. Um, so there's just lots of opportunities. Cobalt and nickel could be recovered from the Missouri mines, um, could be recovered um, from cobalt. Uh, there's a new cobalt mine that's uh, opening up in Idaho. Um, there are companies that are looking at their existing 
existing plants right now to determine if they can re recover and what innovations. And so I'm a member of the Critical Materials Institute, which is funded by the Department of Energy. So we specifically have a project looking at gallium, germanium, and indium recovery from our zinc plants. Are some of our environmental regulations too stringent to currently allow the productive use of raw or byproducts for these critical minerals? I'm not a policy person, so I'm not going to say what is stringent or not stringent. That's for <laughs> this is team body. We'll, we'll to, say that. Yeah, <laughs> you can say that. I will say that um, the need to require the, the needs of the policies have shut down plants. So there's, there's no primary lead smelters in the United States anymore because of the requirements that are put on by the EPA and the local states. The last lead smelter was shut down in Herculaneum, Missouri in 2013. So any raw, we recycle a lot of lead, but any new lead that comes into the country has to be imported and most of that comes from China. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. I now recognize the ranking member of Stansbury for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to start uh, by welcoming Mr. George first. Uh, my mother was an operating engineer and I come from a union strong family. So um, really appreciate you here being, um, being with us and representing the workers of your uh, local and of course all the operating engineers. And I wanted to also use that, this opportunity to say, I shared this with the committee yesterday as we were talking about about both mining and oil and gas issues that I was born uh, while my parents were actually working. My mom was a machine oiler uh, that worked at a coal fire power plant in Farmington, New Mexico, and my dad was a welder in the oil and gas fields. And it was because of the fallout of the oil and gas industry in the early 80s that my family actually had to leave that community and ultimately why I grew up in the biggest city in New Mexico. And so I understand very intimately because of my own family history, how big international global issues around our domestic uh, production of minerals and uh, fossil fuel production really affects the families and workers of this country. And we take those issues very, very seriously. And I think obviously your testimony highlights that. But I also think that it's important to recognize that much of what has happened around mining in the United States and its decline is not because of domestic policy, but because as we heard here from Mr. Motes and uh, others, is really has to do with international trade and commodity prices at the international level. And I think, you know, uh, Mr. Mintz has highlighted this in his testimony, um, but it's important to recognize in this hearing that this is not only a issue of strategic and national security for the United States, this is a problem for every major country in the world who is our ally, who depends on these resources for manufacturing, for national security purposes, and for just general economic development. This is not just a U.S. problem. In fact, there are dozens of countries in Europe and Asia and uh, Africa and others that are dependent on these resources and are unable to source them through the global supply chain right now. And we're not just talking about one mineral, we're talking about dozens of minerals, right? So just opening a mine in a place is not gonna solve this problem because we're talking about dozens of minerals that would have to be sourced from many different geologic formations from all over the world as they currently are. But the problem is, is that we cannot responsibly source these materials right now because they're in places where we do not have ally relationships, there are human rights abuses happening, and because we do not have responsible practices happening. So there's not a simple solution here. I want That's one of the things that I really want to highlight. We need a multi-pronged approach. We're going to have to work with our allies who are also seeking these minerals to ensure that we are doing responsible sourcing, especially if that is abroad. It doesn't mean we just open a mine to do it here in the US. It means that we have to actually utilize and help uh, use our international um, support systems and uh, policies to help ensure that we are holding accountable those multinational corporations, some of which are based in the United States and elsewhere, to the highest possible human rights and environmental standards, whether they are operating here in the United States and employing our operating engineers and all of our miners, or whether they are operating abroad. So we really need to use every possible tool at our disposal. 
But I want to take the rest of my time to really focus on the circular economy that Mr. Mintz has brought up here. Now, we know that recycling, reuse, and design is not going to be the only solution. It's only part of the solution. But it represents a significant portion of the supply chain that is underdeveloped right now in the United States. And as Mr. Mintz has stated, is underdeveloped from a policy standpoint with respect to other countries. So Mr. Mintz, could you please share more? What exactly is the circular economy? What is entailed in it? And what does the United States need to do to really advance its circular economy? Thank you, Ms. Stansbury, for that question. Um, most of us, some of us may remember bottle bills or deposits when you could turn in a, a can or a bottle and receive a nickel or a dime back. That's effectively what we're talking about. So in Europe, it really boils down to four things. You have a producer responsibility, you have um, supply chain due diligence, you have recycled content standards, and the state of California is looking at some of these ideas because they have a, a large EV market too, as you indicated, and uh, the nations of Japan and South Korea uh, have uh, really for good markets for this. I want to make one quick, other quick point. In response to the trade dispute that you that you spoke about in 2010 um, between China and really the rest of the world, what happened was Japan and South Korea did in fact begin to build a more circular economy to recycle there because they don't have as many mines as we do, right? So they're bu building it, Europe is building it, and I think that we can do it here too. We can do it with union jobs as well. <laughs> I thank the gentlewoman. The chairman of the full committee, Mr. Westerman, is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Gosar. Thank you to the witnesses. And uh, Mr. Minces, I um, know you stated in your opening remarks that you agreed with uh, the ranking member in my position on uh, you can't mine and permit your way out of it. But I also added to my remarks, you've got to permit, mine, refine, and manufacture. And I. And, and undermining, you could put uh, recycling in there. So I just want to make sure you're in agreement with the whole statement I said, not just the part about mining and permitting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Westerman. Yes, we need to um, mine and permit um, the whole supply chain. We need to do it more responsibly. And I appreciate um, the, the tenor of bipartisanship that uh, you're setting for this committee already. And going back to um, Ms. Stanberry's comments, there's a whole lot we agree on on this. <clears throat> and we have been taken advantage of by foreign countries uh, through our trade program. I've testified in these trade disputes before. And the, the Chinese government, they don't, they don't care about price fixing. They don't care about uh, playing fair. They exploit our system of free markets and rule of law to gain market share. They will use low labor. They will use slave labor. They will use no environmental regulations to produce commodities and to get them into the U.S. market to drive our uh, producers out of business to capture that market share. And they do it in many different industries. So we do need to work on trade. We do need to make American not only mining, but processing and manufacturing stronger than ever before. Um, and we've got the ability to do that because we're blessed with the resources. And uh, Mr. George, I've been to northern Minnesota. I've seen the, the taconite mining. And you know, it was t talking about steel, Arkansas has become one of the largest producers of steel. And it's all recycled steel. But as um, I think Mr. Motes, you mentioned in your testimony, we're like one-tenth or, or less of the steel production of, in the, of China. Yes, we're one-tenth of the steel and about two-thirds of our recycled. And yeah, I was recently in Mississippi County visiting, which if you didn't know, more steel is produced in Mississippi County than any county in the United States. Right. So, but is, is there any way that recycling meets the future demands? Mr. Mr. Motes or Mr. Yes, sir. Obviously, with growth, we can't have a circular economy to supply all of our new needs. So I think any any reasonable person would would say we need to recycle. And and for lithium ion batteries, we already have redwood materials. We have life cycle. People are already building plants in the United States to recycle the lithium ion batteries. So we talk about an all of the above energy approach. We also need an all of the above minerals approach. New mining, recycling, uh, and uh, you know, being as efficient and effective as we can, and 
I want to go back to Mr. George. An interesting thing that I think we fail to take into account all the time is that the mining in northern Minnesota is huge for that area. But when that taconite is, is shipped off to the refineries, there's a value added uh, part to that. And then if that steel out of those refineries goes into automobile manufacturing or building construction, there's even more value added to that. And I talked yesterday about how we produce about 90 or $120 billion worth of raw materials through recycling and mining in the U.S. Um, that when that gets processed, it becomes a value of about $900 billion. But when that processed material gets manufactured, it adds about $3.6 to the U.S. GDP. And it not only, this is about much more than mining. It's about national security, it's about supply chains, but it's also about creating incredible jobs for, for union workers and non-union workers alike and being able to grow our economy and prosper here. Uh, but um, it starts with mining. If you don't have the raw materials, you can't do the, the other part of it. Uh, and Mr. Um, Mr. Motes, I'm, I'm a little biased to your testimony because we're fellow engineers and I know Missouri Rawl has got one of the best mining engineering programs uh, that's out there, but also know that uh, there seems to be a shortage of, of mining engineers and you so aptly talked about the shortage of workers in these mines. And in America, we have to automate and make things more, um, more efficient, safer. Uh, can you, and I just used all my time, but uh, <laughs> thank you all for, the, for your testimony. This is something we need to really follow up on more. And if we will, if we will work on the, the real issues and the real problems, we can really do great things for our country and for the world and prevent um, situations like it are represented in these posters behind me. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, the Chairman of the full Committee. I now recognize. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Mutz, let me just, uh, during your testimony, uh, the reference that you made, uh, and I apologize for the way I ask questions, I'm not a linear thinker like Mr. Westerman, sometimes I, you know, that liberal arts education has messed me up, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Mutz, uh, the history of decline on the critical medical extraction, production, uh, where does uh, regulatory, environmental standards, clean air, clean water, for example, uh, and the permitting, where does that fall into that percentage decline? What would you say is, what part of the cause is that, if that's what we're talking about here? Yeah, I've thought a lot about why our smelters and, and mines have closed. Some of it's just the, the natural resources. Our smelters and refineries were built near mines, and as the mines played out, the, they were not set up to bring in concentrates from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, so economically it was not viable. There are other places where the smelters have shut down because of the implementation of, of more stringent uh, environmental policy. Um, I think we can all acknowledge the history of our mining and metallurgy was dirty, has, you know, but that's before my lifetime. The plants now all operate within the standards that are set by the local, the state, and the federal government. They do so willingly, willingly. Um, and, but because plants were built before that, um, it took money to upgrade and improve them. And the United States was very happy to shut down plants and outsource that production to other countries. So there's some that's policy. There's some that's just economics. And I think like, again, <laughs> Ranking member Stansbury, I think it's a complex situation, and there's no one one answer fits all. But policy is definitely part of it, and permitting for getting new mines on or just it takes forever. And in the 1872 mining law, what role does that play in the? I'm going to defer to that because I I know of the law, but I'm not a mining engineer by trade, and I don't feel like I know the law well enough to to offer an opinion on that. 
And see, that's what linear thinkers do so well. They just kind of <laughs> defer. Um, Mr. Mintz, I, I, uh, in your testimony, and I think one of the things that, that uh, and I back reference to 1872 mining law, uh, I said that, I've said that many of the controversies that we confront in terms of siting and permitting extraction uh, have to do with, with the public's right to know and the public's involvement in it. Uh, in particular, indigenous communities that have become much more active, involved, and assertive about sacred sites, cultural, and historic resources. 1872 does not address that, and yet the practice, and yet we have the conflict that is going on now in terms of consultation and uh, trust responsibility uh, to these nations. Talk a little bit more about that role that you referenced in your testimony in particular. Thank you, Mr. Grohalva. I really appreciate that. I also appreciate your long standing support for reform of 1872 mining law, and we are urging Congress to pass the Clean Energy Minerals Reform Act again this Congress. I just wanted to, um, let me just highlight the Wallapai Nation, just for example, right? Okay. Okay. If you have a, um, an exploratory mine, and it's fewer than five acres, which many of them are going to be, under the law, what happens is you stake your claim, you go to the local BLM office, you file a piece of paperwork and a fee. The way that the government interprets the law is that they have no discretion to deny that exploratory project. Now, the Wallapai have no idea that the exploration is going to happen until the drills hit the, hit the ground, because the notice that the mining company needs to provide is only to the government, but not to any of the people. And so, Mr. Grohalva, that is actually part of the part of the real source of most of the conflict in mine permitting. It's because we're operating under a 19th century statute where we could stake claims and then those minerals go wherever the claim owner wants them to go. Unlike a leasing system, which the rest of the world okay. does. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I think uh, royalties is an issue as well. If we are going to fund dealing with the due diligence on the chain, expediting permitting processes, uh, a, a source of revenue should come from those that are profiting from that extraction. And uh, since we have no royalties at all on, on mining except for coal, uh, I think that's open for discussion as well uh, going forward in this overall discussion about permitting the critical minerals and accessing those. You go back, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. I think the gentleman from Arizona, the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Rosendale, is Recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, everyone on this committee is extremely interested in protecting our land, air, and water quality across the nation and, quite frankly, around the world. And, and most of us, as uh, Chairman uh, Westerman said, have extremely close ties to the land ourselves. Um, we also recognize the need and the benefits realized by utilizing our natural resources. In many cases, in most cases, Rendering the land more productive after the extraction or harvesting of timber, making the land actually more productive than it was prior to any of that activity taking place. Um, Mr. Menzies, I'd like to ask a couple just real basic questions. Uh, if the raw materials that are necessary to literally to support civilization have not even been produced yet, they haven't been, as, as we've heard, permitted, mined, and refined. We, we just can't recycle our way out of, out of this situation either. We need some more materials. Do you believe that we should uh, produce them in the most environmentally friendly methods that are available? Thank you, Mr. Rosendale, for that question. Yes. Okay. Do you believe that they should utilize the safest and most advanced labor standards as they mine these materials? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And do you believe that China uses the most advanced and uh, friendly environmental standards and labor standards? Thank you, Mr. Rosendale, for that question. My understanding from the State Department is no, at okay. least in some region they're in, yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. 
I don't know why we would continue to allow them to, to take on all these activities as we see on the, on the posters behind us uh, and not take over some of this production ourselves. Um, Mr. Motes, I have a couple of questions here for you. The, uh, the Crow, well, yesterday we heard testimony about the refining process and that the United States has dramatic limitations on the, on the processing itself. So it's not just the, the need to mine these materials, but obviously they've got to be smelted, they've got to be processed, uh, all of the above. What, in your opinion, is the primary reason that we don't have these facilities in the United States? I mean, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but if you could expand on that some. Yes, so we export minerals and many of the metals that I've referred to. Uh, we don't have the smelting capacities we used to. Um, they again shut down for both economic reasons because of the lack of a level playing field because when you sell into a commodity market, everybody sells into the same commodity market. And if you're subsidized, um, you know, if your competition is subsidized, then you're at an economic disadvantage. Additionally, the um, the, the environmental regulations that have been put into place created uh, more costs to operate in the United States, and so therefore it became more difficult. So as many people around the room continue to raise the questions about colonialism and, and the, uh, the uh, management of our resources and accusing us of that by exporting all of our raw materials to another country, having them process it, and then us having to purchase the finished product back, doesn't that sort of relegate the United States to be acting like a, 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 colon, uh, a colony of yet one of these other powers? You don't have to answer that. That, that would just be it. Uh, we did learn a lot during COVID that the supply chains are uh, completely um, disruptable and that it, it presents major problems with us, whether we're talking about medications or other finished products that are necessary for our, for our life. I've got another avenue, the Northern Crow, uh, the Northern Cheyenne and the Crow uh, in Montana, they rely heavily on the coal resources that they mine in Montana. And while I know coal hasn't been the top of the subject today, I wanna go down a different little road. Um, the regulatory conditions that have been imposed on the power industry has caused the closure of 50% of the coal strip uh, electric plant that the, the Crow and Northern Cheyenne depend on completely for our jobs and for revenue. Uh, without it, they would have 65, 70% unemployment rates. Uh, it's a mind to mouth operation. So they mine it and then it goes directly to this power plant. Um, if we don't have the baseload electricity, what challenges does that present for processing and manufacturing and things like that? We're not, as we talk about trying to electrify the, the nation for not only the electric cars, but also to the, the processing of the, the very materials. Am I allowed to answer the question? Mr. Chair, I have expired on my time, but he, the, the, the gentleman can answer the question. Thank you very much, Chair. Obviously, you've identified the ability to generate electricity is going to be substantial. If we're going to electrify uh, our vehicles um, and then the raw materials that we need to do that. Obviously, we, the United States sits on 250 years of coal reserves to supply all of our electrical needs. We've chosen not to do that. We have a lot of natural gas reserves. Um, because of fracking and other things. And so, you know, they're there. Um, and so the opportunity to, um, to use those energy resources responsibly, I think are still available. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would yield back. Thank you for your- I welcome. thank the gentleman from Montana. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gallego is recognized. Thank you, Chair Gosar and Ranking Member Stansberry. As a member of both the Natural Resources and Armed Services Committee, I agree that securing our supply of critical minerals is a national security concern. That's why we need to look at seriously at all possible solutions for sourcing and securing responsibly produced minerals. Uh, my first question is, is to Mr. Mincy's. In your testimony, you describe the actions this administration and the 117th Congress took to manage supply chain risk for critical minerals. Could you please elaborate on why this diversified approach is strategic for natural uh, security? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gallego, for that question. Uh, the Biden administration and Congress have really taken three major approaches, diversifying supply and uh, pursuing recycling and also looking at mine waste. Um, 
the steps that the administration and the Congress last took, um, I wanted to just disclaim, I don't necessarily support all of them, but I just wanted to share that the infrastructure law made the FAST Act permanent. The FAST Act um, has included hard rock mining as a covered sector therein. The IRA funded a billion dollars to our agencies to help speed permitting. The infrastructure, the infrastructure law um, also created a working group designed to help speed permitting. We'll be seeing the re those reports coming, coming out soon. So when you think about the infrastructure law, the funding for the agencies through FY23 budget, the uh, uh, inserting, uh, making the FAST Act permanent, and also the tax cuts for mining in the Inflation Reduction Act and the mineral sourcing provisions of the electric vehicle uh, battery tax credit, we have um, a lot of incentives uh, to, go, uh, to go mine and also to responsibly source the materials uh, that we need. So we, we've already taken a lot of steps through the IRA and EJA in, in, in that respect. Thank you. Uh, to make our nation secure, we must proactively plan also for the future. Mr. Loris, in your testimony, you know that the critical minerals that the economy relies on today may look much different in 20 or 30 years. Could you please elaborate on the importance of investing in research and development to reduce our critical mineral dependency? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I think we've heard a lot of different predictions over the years about peak oil, about uh, running out of food. Uh, a lot of them have not come true. Uh, and uh, in terms of research and development, our national labs have been critical in exploring ways to recycle, uh, ways to extract alternative resources. And I think the more we can have flexibility in those processes uh, so that they can shift in case of national security needs shift or economic shift, uh, the better off that they're going to be. And I think the better off the private sector working with the national labs will be able to pivot. So I, I view uh, the national labs, I, I view our research universities as fundamental in the solution to this all of the above approach that we need to take. Right. It's, and again, all of the above. Um, so taking this kind of long-term all of the above approach to national security, it's clear that our critical mineral needs and sources will also change. So Mr. Mincy's, you have spoken about the benefits of a circular economy. Uh, why is a circular economy an effective long-term national security solution? Thank you. I, I appreciate that. The reason is we're not really sure, Mr. Gallego, today what mineral we'll need tomorrow. So if we build the infrastructure to recycle it now, we'll already have it. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's speak about cobalt for a second. Cobalt's not going to be around in batteries in five or ten years, I don't imagine. It'll be a different metal, won't it? So why don't we recycle the batteries now and the materials we have now so that if we make it to the 22nd century and we're on the verge of another minerals rush, by then we've reformed the law? Surely. Yeah. But by then, at least we'll know we'll have the circular economy infrastructure we need to actually source the material that we're looking for at the time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not going to ask your if we make the 22nd century thesis, but I appreciate everyone's testimony here. And I think to, you know, at least to reemphasize, and I think both sides have actually some very valid claims, and we do need to look at this. At least I look at it from a national security perspective. Let's have an all, uh, you know, all above, uh, all, all methods to, to get their approach. And I appreciate everyone's testimony. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, is recognized the vice chair of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I get started uh, with my questions, I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the honor of serving as vice chair for this very important subcommittee. I, um, I'm looking forward to serving under you as we look to unleash American energy and hold the Biden administration accountable for the America last policies that have caused energy prices to rise as high as Chinese spy balloons. Now, for my questions, Mr. Loris, um, the chairman mentioned uh, in his opening statement that permitting a new hard rock mine in the United States can take more than a decade. Can you or any of the other witnesses tell us why this is and uh, what exactly causes this process to take so long and how has the Biden administration made this even more difficult? Yeah, I'm happy to start and welcome input from others. Uh, you know, if you look at some of our, our bedrock environmental laws, you know, chiefly the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, it, it has gotten um, much harder to permit processes 
uh, for everything from clean energy projects to conventional fuel projects. Uh, and and uh, that in conjunction with the you know, seemingly endless litigation for a lot of these projects just holds up uh, any type of investment and any type of development for years in the courts. And so, you know, Congressman Lamborn said, are, are environmental regulations too stringent? And I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think it's that they're incredibly inefficient. Uh, we, we should welcome strong, stringent environmental safeguards that protect air quality and water quality, but we can't have processes where they're just held up for, you know, years um, by certain agencies. There's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of duplication, and then there's a, a lot of lawsuits from public interest groups too. I, I think uh, sometimes public interest groups can be helpful for people who don't have the resources to uh, bring forth litigation, but a lot of times uh, they are doing it because they just don't want the project being built, which is something I think Mr. George commented on in his oral testimony. And so uh, if you look at some of the data, uh, the private landowners and tribal groups from the years, I think 2001 to 2013, brought only 3% of the litigation for filing NEPA lawsuits, over 50% was from public interest groups. So we just need a much more efficient process to get an up or down vote uh, on whether these projects should move forward. And, and I think a lot of the private sector in the United States welcomes stringent environmental safeguards. They just want some regulatory certainty more than anything else. Good, thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to comment on that? Yes, sir, Mr. George. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add that in my experience working on projects that need these types of permits, whether it be, uh, you know, we just put a, uh, replaced a, an old oil pipeline in Minnesota uh, with a brand new one. And that took eight years to permit and get done lawsuits process. Um, we have a mine right now in Minnesota that's gone through a process for 20 years. They had their permits, lawsuits. Some of them were taken back. Now they've been repealed. It's in the Supreme Court. Uh, and that's on an existing mine site where they've mined before. Uh, so the frustration is real. I think certainty is exactly uh, Mr. Larissa is talking about is is what's critical. What I've seen, you asked about what's been done, banning mining in 225,000 acres where you have these minerals is a chilling uh, impact on business and exploration and on companies' willingness to uh, uh, put up money to explore these projects. Um, there was a project, particular project in that area that is now banned um, that has spent hundreds of millions of dollars already just to see their leases pulled and mining banned in the region arbitrarily. So I think all of these things are troubling. I think what you all can do is provide certainty and not allow government agencies to bypass a process, hold them accountable to that, because right now they're just doing whatever they want from my experience. Yes, sir. Um, and, and I don't want to cut anybody else off, but I want to go to a, to a quick question that really plays into that, uh, Mr. George, because there's a lot of talk about mining and, and uh, jobs versus tourism jobs in uh, certain parts of the country, and it seems as though some opponents of domestic mining like to pit these industries against each other. As someone in the mining industry and based on your experience, how much do tourism jobs pay in comparison to what mining jobs pay? I can tell you, you know, the, our members that will, uh, thank you for the question, our members that will build these mines make, you know, on average $40 an hour on the check, in addition to world-class health care where there's no the family coverage where there's no premiums, in addition to, uh, and low deductibles, in addition to a defined benefit pension, defined contribution plan. Um, and I can tell you that the tourism jobs, you know, I actually went on one of the Outfitters websites to see how exactly how much they're paying. They don't advertise how much they pay, uh, but we know how much they pay, and it's about 15000 bucks a year with no benefits. So uh, when we're told, when people in northern Minnesota are told, well, we just need to innovate our economy and have more tourism jobs, uh, people up there know exactly what that means. It means a lower standard of living, period. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had one more question, but... Uh You'll get another chance. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Georgia. The next one is from a young lady from uh, Florida, Ms. Luna. Thank you, Chairman Gosar. If I can just ask for unanimous consent to enter this into the record. Thank you. Um, I can't stop thinking about, uh, Mr. Loris, what you told us earlier about some of this stuff that you'd witnessed with some of the human rights abuses. Real quickly, what is the youngest age of some of the children that you've heard have been working in these mines? 
uh, you know, ranging from, you know, five to six years old. And, you know, sometimes teens will have babies sh strapped to them um, while they're digging out the cobalt by hand. So, I mean, you're, you're literally talking about infants uh, at these mine sites. I just want to share a stat with everyone on the panel. Children who work in these mines are frequently drugged to suppress extreme hunger and fatigue of working in such harsh conditions. If you can just pass it that way. Um, from our perspective, I think everyone on this panel would agree that if there's a way to move our industry away from China, it's probably the best thing from a human rights perspective. But my question, Mr. George, is because I'm not from a mining community, I'm from a fishing community, um, how does the United States mining standards differ from countries specifically that in the Congo were, or where China's operating to conduct some of these uh, mineral mining processes? Well, I can talk about labor standards in terms of our rights here in this country to organize unions, which we've done. Um, and the standards, the, the people that have done that and people have literally died for those rights here in this country to, to obtain those rights. And when people uh, organize and they have unions, they lifts everybody up. So whether you're union or non-union, you would benefit from those standards that we set. And it Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Is it in your opinion that this administration's policies have put a um, hindrance on domestic mining operations? 100% uh, yes. When you ban 225,000 acres of, of uh, land where these minerals exist, I don't see how you could argue otherwise. So I guess this would bring me to my next question, Mr. Minces. Um, I had heard your perspective and I understand what you're saying about respecting the rights of indigenous peoples in regards to mining. However, this committee has the ability to recognize that I think it's, in a, again, our opinion to do the least harm possible, um, not just to the environment, but to other people as well, right? The human rights perspective. And if we have the ability in the United States to bring in these resources and then export them and ensure that people are not only being respected, but also to that we're protecting the environment in the process, don't you think that that would be a opportunity for us to responsibly um, harvest these, min these minerals, even if it is on indigenous lands. Thank you, Mrs. Luna, for that, that, that thoughtful question. I think that there are a lot of really great opportunities for so, us. Sorry, can you pause for a second? I don't know if that was funny, but I was asking a question, and so I'm just asking for you guys to be respectful while I'm asking the question. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mrs. Luna. I, I do think that there are opportunities for us to be able to onshore the uh, stronger links of the circular economy infrastructure here in the United States, and that we ought to be able to raise standards here, labor standards, environmental standards here, and everywhere around the world, which is why, in particular, when the Biden administration is going to the mining in Daba in, South, in, in Cape Town, we're urging real due diligence standards. And part of the bipartisanship, I think, of this committee is I think there's an, we all want oversight. We all want accountability from the Biden administration. I want to know what those due diligence standards really are. I want to know. And so, Mrs. Luna, I think we can work together and try to figure out how we can raise the standards here and abroad. So then my final question for you would be, right now the United States has re-entered the Paris Climate Accord, and that's enabled places like China to not only go forward and economically just completely dominate us, but also to, from an energy perspective and a mining perspective, they're not only complicit in human rights abuses, but they're also destroying the environment. If we have the opportunity to pull back, would you say that that would be in the best interest of our country to do so? Thank you, Mrs. Luna. That's a, that's a really good question. I'd actually like to associate myself with uh, Mr. Lewis's comments with respect to China's uh, position vis-a-vis -vis rare earth elements and their position in the market. It's my view that they've actually lost market share since the recent 2010 trade dispute. And so there are, I think as we've discussed, some trade options available to sort of reduce our dependency that way. Notably, Senator Wyden earlier this week just sent several letters to a number of original equipment manufacturers, mostly domestic ones, who were sourcing materials from the Xinjiang region of China, allegedly. And so what they're saying, what Senator Wyden is asking, same thing I'm asking, where's your due diligence plan? And so we're asking the administration, we're asking OEMs to show us what they're, how it is that we're making sure that slave labor isn't happening within their supply chains so that we can all responsibly source the materials that we need. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Minnesota. 
Mr. Stauber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record an E&E &E news article uh, titled, Biden Administration Looks to Overseas Mining for EV and Renewable Needs. And it was dated January 23rd of 23. Objection so ordered. Mr. Uh, Goldstar, again, thanks for allowing me uh, to, uh, waving me on and allowing me to uh, uh, question some of our witnesses. Uh, Mr. George, thank you once again for coming here. I think this is three Congresses in a row that you have testified on behalf of mining and your membership uh, in Minnesota. Your testimony speaks for itself. Banning mining in 225,000 acres of a working national support uh, force, superior national force is a working industrial force. And guess what? They banned 225,000 acres without any environmental impact statement, without looking at the specific mine plan. It was purely political. The biggest copper nickel find in the world and this administration, not only did they pull the leases uh, and, and ban mining, including taconite mining, what they did was take union jobs away because there was a pri uh, project labor agreement in place. The best labor standards and best environmental standards in this administration turned a blind eye. Yet, the article that I just entered, Biden administration goes to foreign overseas uh, mining that used child slave labor. It's unacceptable and immoral that this, that this administration uh, is, is, uh, is using uh, child slave labor to mine the critical minerals to get to the, uh, the, the green economy. Meanwhile, many anti-mining lawmakers and advocates look down on union jobs building our mines, saying they're not, they're not lifetime employment. They are lifetime employment. They're multi-generational jobs with project labor agreements. Mr. Uh, George, can you explain real quick the importance of these jobs and the project labor agreements, the union membership, and what it does for our communities? Thank you, Congressman. I'm happy to. Uh, these jobs are dignity. These jobs are respect. These jobs allow people to raise families. Um, these jobs, those jobs, those mining jobs in northern Minnesota are the only reason people are there. Uh, and they spin off every industry is related to the mines, as was pointed out earlier. So uh, these jobs are, they could not be more important. And they're, they're that quality because, you know, the standard of living and the labor standards in our area have been raised by unions like mine. Mining is our past, our present, and our future. This administration banned mining in northern Minnesota to include taconite mining. The, the, the union members, they have children, they go to our hospitals, they go to our grocery stores, they recreate up there, uh, and simply unacceptable. Mr. Goetz, it's great to see you again, and thank you for joining us today. And I appreciate you mentioning China's already enormous and growing percentage of global steel. As you know, we have been mining uh, iron for steel making in my district for over 135 years. And as Mr. George says, we have the cleanest water in the state of Minnesota in the heart of our mining region. The mineral withdrawal we discussed earlier includes a ban on taconite in the 225,000 acres of the uh, Superior National Forest, which is an industrial working forest. As the United States loses its steel supply to China, how damaging would it be to take, take known and possible taconite reserves offline to our production? Thank you for the question. Um, while we recycle a lot of steel, um, it always gets degraded. Copper is a bad element. And so we always need um, a certain amount of virgin material coming from our iron ore mines. Therefore, if you want the lightweight steels that are needed for cars, for tank armor, those types of things, we need to have mining capabilities in the United States to produce that. And of course, your state produces most of our mine from taconite mines. 80% of it. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Um, Mr. Loris, thank you for joining us in the last 30 seconds. I introduced the Permit for Mining Needs Act, uh, which provides needed updates to our broken permitting process. It's supported by the National Association of Building Trades, Unions, Energy Groups, Mining Trades, and more. Can you please discuss quickly how permitting reform and the provisions to improve mining permitting in my bill will actually lead to lower emissions in the long run? 
Yeah, you know, as, as several members and uh, witnesses have mentioned, you know, if, we, if we're not doing the permitting and processing and extraction here in the United States and other developed countries, it's going to happen elsewhere, especially with a lot of policies, government-induced demand that's going to increase the demand for these minerals, and therefore the prices are going to increase, and that's only going to increase supplies in other parts of the world. So if we don't do it here, where are those emission standards are the most stringent, emissions worldwide are going to be likely higher. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yield back and again. Thank you for Thank waiting. You, gentlemen. Yeah. I'm going to recognize myself. Mr. George, I want to come back to you. You know, trust is a series of promises kept. And so I would look at that we would make agreements in regards to national force or, or uh, uh, multiple use of public lands. That you're forming an internal treaty. Now, on the forest we're talking about, the national forest, there's something very unusual about this agreement because it actually had a buffer system enclosed, right? Not an expert on the, the, B, the B, you're talking about the boundary waters and- Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there was, there was, when that, the boundary waters were created, and I'm not an expert in, in that policy, but my understanding is, and you know, we've all come to understand that mining was an activity that was supposed to happen right. in the region. There was areas that set aside for the uh, logging Correct. and for mining. Correct. And so, you know, we have to start looking at this. And, and, and Dr. Moats actually, but one of my, my other points, you just can't recycle. You have to add virgin material into most, almost all this stuff. Mr. Mintz, uh, have we started really any of the recycling for the solar cells right now? Thank you, Mr. Gosar. I, uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, recycling for um, solar, recycling of the solar products is fairly robust and it's, it's a growing industry. And in fact, the truth is that with respect to the solar industry, I don't think we'll need to do much mining to source the minerals we need for the solar technologies. We do have weak links in other areas of the solar supply chain, it's just not in mining. Ms. Dr. Moats, you're shaking your head. Do you want to respond to that question? So I agree with him that um, most solar panels are already uh, recycled here in the United States. Um, I'm very familiar with some of the processes, so they're very robust. But if you look at, and there's been multiple studies done at the growth of solar energy that is being projected, there is no way we're going to be able to recycle to supply all of the solar uh, silicon panels and the tellurium that's needed. I've written several research papers on this, looking at where we can get more tellurium in the world. And the simple answer is we need to produce more from our existing operations and future mines. Thank you. Uh, you know, and, and you made a statement, I think several of you made statements in regards to, we don't know what the needs are for the future. And when you start looking that way, you have to inventory these minerals as we go. So are you familiar with some of the new technology and actually the smeltering process? in regards to extraction of some of these metals or uh, minerals, and in, in fact, all of the minerals out of the ore body, Dr. Mullins? Yes, we have several research projects ongoing at the university, and I'm aware of other ones as well, where we're looking at advanced technologies to, to really analyze why are we not recovering more. So the current research believes that about, again, we'll go to tellurium, because that's what I've been looking at most recently. 60 to 90% of the world of the tellurium that's mined is not being recovered. So why is that? Why, why are we not doing that? So we're using advanced technologies and looking at why that is. And that can be applied across the board to all of our mining operations, all of our processing plants. And that's what I would encourage you to, to look at. Thank you, Mr. Mance again. Um, so why would it be a problem that we have existing mine sites? For example, a manganese uh, mine site uh, in, my, in my district. Why would the federal government, because of technology that we have today, that we can extract almost all the manganese from those tailings that are sitting there, why would the federal government resist and say no to that? Thank you, Mr. Grosser, for that question. Um, the federal government has said yes, resoundingly has said yes. The infrastructure law funded $320 million to the United States, I think it was, that's right, to USGS to do exactly what you just described. And so it's my, under, it's my belief, and I'm not a geologist, but I think the geologists are pretty excited right now because they're real opportunities to, for example, look at mine waste as a potential source of some of these materials. I think it's really important. There are some places where that actually may, I'm gonna just speak for some of Earthworks constituents. We've, we've had some people come to us and say, 
under some circumstances, that could be a good idea. That could work. Others have said, no, 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 no. We're already an EPA Superfund site. Please don't come back here and, and start mucking around in, in the metals already. So the answer is yes, Mr. Gosar, at least in some areas, under some circumstances, that is a viable opportunity. Well, that, that, I, I would agree, but we, we need to make it uniform all the way across the board. If these are sites that have that previous mining there, we ought to make sure that those areas are, are prioritized. And that's not been the case in Arizona. So with the manganese. So, my time is, has expired, um, so I, I will, uh, we have votes any time now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do we want to do a second round? Sure. Okay. Remember, you're up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I just went. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and um, try not to uh, talk with my mouth full, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but I do want to just take this opportunity as we're closing out this hearing to just revisit some of the um, discussion today. And, you know, I really want to frame this conversation around the urgency of this issue. I think some of that got lost in the details today. This is not only a national security emergency for the United States. This is about making sure that we can make good on our responsibility to ensure that we are not passing a global tipping point in climate change over the next decade. If we do not address these supply chain issues, we will not be able to implement the technologies and changes to our energy systems that will enable us to cut carbon emissions so that we can hit our carbon emission standards to prevent catastrophic climate change. So this is an urgent issue. It's a national security issue. It's an economic issue for the United States, and it's a global issue. But in the pursuit of addressing these global and national security issues, we cannot return to this. We cannot mine and permit our way to a solution. I think as we've heard here today, and I don't think anyone in this room, obviously those of us who serve on this committee care deeply about nature, the environment, the outdoors. I don't think anyone in this room wants to return to the past where corporations went into communities, made mining claims, and then strip mined them. I bet we have a lot of outdoors people here, a lot of fishermen, a lot of people who are hikers and spend time outside. Can you imagine? What I am hearing in this hearing, and I think oftentimes the false equivalency that gets put forward, is the idea that if we just gutted our environmental laws, if we just took away the Clean Water Act, if we just took away the Clean Air Act, if we just got rid of NEPA, we could just open up all these mines and solve this problem. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not going to solve the problem. And I don't think that anyone in this room wants to return to an era when we had rivers on fire, when smelters were poisoning children in communities across the country, and where when people went to their favorite fishing spot or a tribal community went to pray in one of their most sacred sites, they found that a mining claim had been laid and strip mined. I don't think anyone wants to return that to that era. And certainly, I don't think American workers want to return to that era. So what we need to do is really take an approach that is smart, that is science-based, that is a human rights-based approach that really addresses this issue from all aspects. Of course, we have to address the international security and trade issues. Of course, we have to address the human rights abuses that are happening from the sourcing of some of these minerals. And I want to be clear, this is a mine with cobalt. We're talking about dozens of different minerals across the world. There are mines that are doing responsible sourcing that do have good labor practices. But what we need is to make sure that we have a multi-pronged approach that addresses these issues. Finally, I just want to say that this body has already taken significant action to help address these issues. This last Congress, we passed a bipartisan infrastructure law 
It makes some of the largest investments in infrastructure in the history of our country in certain sectors, particularly in natural resources. And it includes a number of provisions that will help to build out a sustainable supply chain for our critical minerals. We also passed the Inflation Reduction Act in August. And while we did not have bipartisan support for that bill here in the House, what I can tell you is that it is the largest single investment in climate action, not only in the history of the United States, but the history of the world. And it sets us on a path, not only to clean energy for the United States, but energy dependence and the ability to address the catastrophic change that will happen from global climate change. The future of our country, of our communities, and of our children depends on bipartisan action on this issue. And Mr. Chairman, I deeply appreciate your bipartisanship this morning and truly look forward to working with my colleagues across the aisle because the urgency of this issue demands that we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Just to take the liberty of making one comment. So if we're really, really worried about climate change, we ought to be looking at bringing the smeltering process back to the United States. Think about this. This is heavy material. It's being transported out, transported back. That's an unnecessary type of a process. So we need to start looking differently. And that's what Einstein said. Don't think more. Think differently. And I think we can make this all work. Gentleman from uh, Montana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, we um, have been hearing a lot of discussions about the mining law of 1872, and that is the only thing that that groups act like that we are relying upon in order to authorize, permit, and, and open a, a mining facility. And I just really, really think that that premise needs to be clarified here. Um, there's an awful lot of additional regulation, and the problem is that this body has allowed those regulations to be drafted and created by outside agencies, thereby uh, granting them the ability to impose those just like they are the rule of law, where we are supposed to be the lawmakers. And we need to make sure that we provide that clarity for industry. We need to provide that clarity for the agencies, and, and it hasn't happened. And because of that, there are groups that have emerged across the nation that have financially benefited from the different laws that are put in place, making sure that they're able to get their legal fees back again once they tie up many of the uh, mines and extractive industries and harvesting of timber, things that, again, would not only benefit the nation economically and financially and from a national security standpoint, but actually help the environment as well because it's just good management of the land. So. Um, Mr. Motes, I would like to ask you, um, it's clear that we don't rely just upon the mining laws of 1872. Could you tell me just a few of the things that an uh, organization would have to go through and the permitting that they would have to achieve in order to open up one of these facilities? Thank you for the question. I'm, again, I'm not sure that as a, I'm not a mining engineer and I'm not sure that I know the depth of the knowledge that I'd like to have to answer your question. I do know that the 1872 law is one of the laws. There was, again, laws in 1970 and a revision in 1977 and another one in the 1990s. Um, and then every state and every local community can have their own laws. Um, I think before the House, the National Mining Committee or National Mining Association brought before you and it's in your minutes from like your last Congress where they brought forth the poster that they made to permit a mine in, in the state of Nevada. And it started over there and it went all the way around the room. And uh, so it's, it's quite extensive. And there are now mines in Minnesota and Arizona um, that have been trying to be permitted for 13 to 15 years. And I would just uh, echo what has already been said by my uh, former fellow witness, which is I don't think we're asking for to get away and gut existing laws. 
I think the mining industry and the process industry just wants certainty. If you look at the Australians and the Canadians, they have a two, three year ter permitting turnaround. You can make business decisions. Right now with the uncertainty, open-endedness of whether or not who's in it, who's the administration is in charge and whether or not things will be, you know, licenses will be pulled and so forth, it's the uncertainty. I can give you numerous examples over my career where people have brought it. We could have a copper smelter in Texas right now, except for that a company from, we'll say an Asian country, not an allied Asian country, was going to put one in in, in, in Japan. Uh, I mean, Japan was going to put in a smelter in Texas. And after having to deal with the permits for 10 years, they said, no, we're not going to do that. So it's a real problem. Thank you very much. And, and again, if we, uh, we, none of us are sure what minerals and elements are going to be utilized and most efficient in 10 years from now. It, it certainly makes it difficult to try permitting today for something that is, is unknown. Uh, once we determine what we need, if it's going to take another 10 years or 20 years before you can actually refine it, mine it, and utilize it, uh, by then it, it could very well could be replaced by uh, yet another mineral. And I can tell you that in the state of Montana, which is known as the treasure state because of all of the minerals that we produce, we have not cr uh, issued a new mining permit in 20 years in 20 years, and that is a shame. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, gentleman from Montana. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. The, chair, the, the ranking. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I'm one that, that in my time in this committee, I've, ha I've hated the second round questions, but I'm going to take advantage of it today. Uh, uh, Dr. Mott, let me, let, let's time sequence issue. We're dealing today because uh, the urgency is that uh, as my colleagues across the aisle have made pointedly clear today is and, and yesterday and the day before is that the, the Biden administration is effectively uh, not only standing in the way but making it impossible uh, for uh, the kind of critical mineral extraction in this topic to get done. That's the timeline that we're dealing with right now politically and I guess in terms of a reaction to a policy. It's the Democrats, it's this and that, and that's the timeline, two years. Uh, things were much rosier for the previous uh, administration during those four years. Everything was fine. The, the, the regulatory demands wasn't there. NEPA wasn't there. Litigation wasn't there. Thank you for the question. No, this has been a problem for 20, 30 years. And, and, and the root of the issue is still, in my mind, and your reaction, uh, uh, an antiquated mining law that has not been reformed, updated to this particular century we're in? I would not classify my comments that way. I think the mining law has been modified. But maybe the mining law has not, but there have been additional legislation that has been passed that all the mining companies and processing companies have to adhere and to. And it was around issues of public health primarily where they started to get generated in the 70s when health issues became the critical question. And, and uh, so let's, that's the root of why this discussion is going on. The practices and abuses of the past and that legacy is not something that people want to repeat. The processes that are being put in place and being talked about now are uh, in terms of permitting reform is to begin to eliminate some of those protections. And, and, and as the ranking member said, the complexity of the, this issue doesn't mean that you leave something behind that was put in place in order to protect public health and communities. I, uh, I think this question is, is not simplistic. And this question is not going to be solved by, by just talking about permitting reform and the poor mining companies. The other question I would like to ask Mr. Mintz is ownership. I mean, this isn't, this isn't, the guy that got the grub stack putting, his, putting uh, things on his burro and going up the mountain to look for gold and silver, uh, 1872 kind of style. We are talking about multinational foreign owned companies across the, the whole area. One of the things I've been promoting, if we're serious about, uh, is that those mining companies that have those horrendous human, environmental, and labor abuses and are doing businesses in other parts of the world, wouldn't it be prudent for the United States to ban them from doing business on our public lands and waters? 
as a consequence to those practices, as a deterrent to those practices, as an incentive to stop those practices? Forgive me, Mr. Grohalva. You mean as an in to mind you? Go ahead. We keep talking about it this as, as an American issue, and it is. But the ownership and the exportation of most of these minerals is foreign, including Chinese. Even some of the mines in Arizona have a percentage of which are Chinese owned. So, should they be banned? Because, you know, they are the bad guys. Thank you, Mr. Grohalva. I, I do. You illustrate a really important point about the way the, the 1872 mining law functions. And I'm going to defer to you and to the, your colleagues who serve on armed services to make decisions about what is in our national security. What I'm suggesting, though, is that if anybody, foreign or domestic, friendly or not, can stake a claim to American minerals, and then they own those by virtue of this statute, I'm suggesting that makes me feel insecure, and I urge, uh, and, and so that's why we're urging your reform, so that we have a leasing system for public lands minerals, where we can have an upfront suitability determination and know, you know, uh, you know, know what kinds of uh, who's going to be leasing these things. There are other reforms too, and, and, and apply and, and, and provide a surety to the private sector and a surety to the workers at, at that level. I think that's why. This law works against that assurity, I think. Anyway, you're back. I, I love the gentleman's, uh, uh, where he's going with this. But you never do treaties from a weak point. You do it from a power of strength. So in, in, in the aspect of, of trying to uh, uh, say no to China, we actually make it worse for us and better for them. Look what we did with Russia, with oil. We said we're barring them. Oil shot up, they had more profits. They had more tanks, they had more things to buy with that money. So once again, this goes back to what Einstein said. Don't think more, think differently. I'll give you an example. What if I told you about oil sands? And the, the, the gentleman, the three chemists who figured out how to extract oil sands, want to give it to the American people. They don't want to give it to a company. They want it to give to the United States. It's very profitable. They can produce a barrel of oil, sweet crude, that we have very little of, for $11 a barrel. Wow. Wow. So there, we, we have to think creatively here. We can't pick one aspect. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, before I get into some other comments, Mr. Motes, or Dr. Motes, sorry, I think uh, your comment on 20 to 30 years is exactly a why I'm here today. We're sick and tired of the agencies in this federal government regulating and pushing people out of business. It's one of the reasons we have an oversight in every committee that we've got up here. They act like they're a fourth branch of government and they need to be brought under control. So I appreciate your comment. As far as uh, the chairman was talking about solar panels, as someone that's in the transportation industry, you may not realize this, but we utilize solar panels and today, we can't hardly get them because there's such a back order on them. So they, they are being utilized more and more, and we really don't know what the potential for solar panels are. So, you know, that, uh, that just uh, another added example of, of how we need to be mining instead of just recycling. Uh, Mr. George, um, I wanted to follow up on something real quick. You were talking about uh, replacing a pipeline that took eight years, an old mine, uh, an old mine that was trying to get repermitted, and it took over 20 years. I understand there's uh, regulations, and then there's federal government just dragging their feet. Do you have a percentages of, of how much of that was litigation versus just the federal government dragging their feet? I, I probably can't give you percentages, but it's both. It's it's uh, local state government dragging its feet, they, those agencies, it's federal government permits dragging their feet or just ignoring permit requests, it's lawsuits, it's litigation, it's all of it. And I would just, you know, just add real quickly, um, my, my friends here who are talking about recycling, um, I don't know if you've ever been around a metal recycling plant, but uh, good luck getting those permitted. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Lawrence, I had a, I had a question at the very beginning. We didn't get to it. Um, you referenced the decline in metal smelters and uh, refineries in, in the United States. And uh, why have we lost our domestic facilities? And how do we compare with competitors like China? I think we're down to what, two, maybe three smel copper smelters in the US? Three versus what, 50 in China? That might be more for Dr. Motes. Um, I think he has more information on that. I will just say, I think it's a combination of factors. I think regulations certainly play a part. I think the flooding of markets and, and competition abroad certainly play a part and, and certainly render some of these things uneconomical. Um, but Dr. Motes is more of a, an expert on that than I am. We currently have three copper smelters, two copper refineries in the United States. Um, there's a German company who's looking to install a secondary or a recycling smelter in Georgia. Um, Arubis is getting the permits and I believe is starting to break ground. Um, why did they, why did we used to have 13 to 14 smelters when I started my career and have shut down? It's because of one, the mining grades have declined, two, because it's more profitable for mining companies to export the minerals than to upgrade their existing smelters, so they shut them down from an economic standpoint. Is that due to regulations? That's part of it. I mean, they have to, to, to adhere to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and all the other acts and all the local, the local things. And so they made an economic decision that it was more profitable to ship the minerals ex elsewhere. It's not just copper, it's lead, it's zinc, it's many. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Minnesota is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just uh, want to um, re reiterate uh, some comments from Chairman Westerman, and this is uh, to our, our ranking member. Um, we have to reform our permitting process in order for us to mine, bring processing and manufacturing back to our country. That is a great start. That is going to help secure our strategic national security. I have a question for Mr. Motes, and the question is this. If today China and Russia stopped selling us rare earths and critical minerals, what would it do to our national security? It would be, be devastating. I mean, we can't survive, uh, not just us, but the entire world is dependent on China specifically. But the Russians produce some nickel and some platinum group metals, so that we're also dependent on there. It's a interconnected world economy, and if you take off the United, China specifically because they produce 40 to 50 to 80 to 90 percent of each of these things, um, it would be devastating. I just want to everyone to understand his answer to my question. If, if today the communist country of China and Russia stopped selling us their rare earths and critical minerals, his response, it would be devastating to the United States. How can we allow that to happen? The strategic national security. When we have these natural resources in the palm of our own hand in our country using our environmental and labor standards. How did we get this way? Why? And then I entered into, into the record, the E&E &E news article, where this administration goes to four nations to process these. Give me a break. I want to just reiterate something uh, that was the question on um, uh, my friend from Georgia asked. The Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness uh, was incorporated in 1978. The Democrat member of Congress who sat in this position, James Oberstar from Minnesota, did not support that. He did not support the, the wilderness taking that offline. But the fact of the matter is the wilderness was put, uh, the, was made. And then a buffer zone around the wilderness was put forth. And I want everybody to know that there will be no mining in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, and there will be no mining in the buffer zone around it. But like my colleague way back in the late 70s said, if you're going to make this wilderness on that outside, do not take our livelihood away. And he was referring to timber harvesting and mining. He was so far ahead of us in his thinking because he knew today 
we would be fighting for these jobs and these minerals. That's how far Congressman Oberstar was ahead of the thinking. And it's, it, it, it really, really um, pains me to hear your answer that it would devastate the United States of America. We need to have permitting reform to mine in our country, to process and manufacture. We, for strategic reasons, need to do this. And I am looking forward to a healthy debate on how we can do that, how we can bring back our manufacturing and our mining and our processing to the shores of this country. You know, if we didn't learn anything from COVID, shame on us. Shame on us. The dependency that we have allowed this nation to go forward and, 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 and depend on adversarial nations for our strategic national security. We can't allow that. We have to, we have to change course today. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I'm going to recognize myself. And then I'm going to prepare the witnesses. One of the things I've always done in the past is ask you, after I'm done with questions, what was the one question you wanted to have asked? What is its answers, but it was never asked? Okay? So uh, I thank the gentleman from Minnesota. I want to enter in a colloquy with him if you stay, stay behind. Our mining and... Uh, uh, enjoying the wilderness and the environment, mutually exclusive. We can do both. We've proved we can do both because we've been mining for 135 years in northern Minnesota, and it is a great, northern Minnesota is a great recreational area to, to live, work, raise a family, and make a good wage. I also would ask him, who is more stringent on uh, things in our backyard, the federal government or the, the people of uh, the towns, counties, and cities uh, Minnesota. The uh, towns, counties, and cities uh, have their pulse uh, on these issues, and as uh, Mr. George said, they support mining and, on the Iron Range. Uh, do they also uh, believe in the same principle that I brought up of Einstein? They think differently, not more, right? It's particularly within the repurposing of the Tacnite mines. That's correct. Great fishing there, right? Very. I would say, uh, Chair Gosar, I don't want to, may I, would you yield to me for 20 seconds? Sure. You came up to northern Minnesota several years ago with my predecessor in the Western Caucus. The same issues that we were dealing with back then, the same two major mines, it's been how many, eight, seven, eight years ago, uh, and the permitting for one of the mines is in its 20th year, and another going into its 10th year. And those, the, the biggest copper nickel find in the world, 95% of the nickel, 88% of the cobalt, over a third of the copper and other platinum group metals are sitting in a beautiful reserve in northern Minnesota. So I'm going to take it from there. Um, uh, Dr. Moats, I would actually, uh, there was comments made today in regards to uh, uh, the permitting process. Part of the problem that I have found, um, and I'm the one responsible to getting the resolution copper uh, through uh, uh, Congress, but we still haven't mined a, a darn thing, is, is the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy, you have people inserted that, thought, that believe that they're there to stop something. And that's not what I understand. My understanding is they're here to facilitate uh, the implementation of the laws that Congress passes. Are you in agreement with that? Having done my degree at University of Arizona, bear down. <laughs> um, I've listened to Rio Tinto talk a lot about the Resolution Copper uh, project over the years. And of course, they're very politically sensitive and don't really say anything. Um, but it seems very clear that when they make a step forward, it's two steps back for, for many years. And we're now over 13, 15 years trying to permit that. And I know there's lots of problems with that. There's tribal lands, there's deep, deep mines, there's lots of issues related to that. And so I think, again, what my colleague next to me said, I think the mining companies are just looking for clarity on there's a fixed time. And if we don't make it through, then we don't make it through. So we can make an investment somewhere else, opposed to just the uncertainty of if we'll ever be allowed to do this. 
So I, and I also want to set the record straight. So royalties, there are royalties that are paid for this, right? They just go to the state. Yes, there are royalties. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I agree with the certainty. And, and one of the things that I have been very poignant with uh, Resolution Copper is trust is a series of promises kept. Everything you do, go for transparency and go above the grade. So they have done more than their fair share. They've invested over a billion dollars to reclaim the mine that was there before. A billion dollars. No one talks about that. None, not so ever. So now I'm gonna uh, go to Mr. Loris and, and what was the question you wanted to ask? What well, wasn't asked and what's this answer? Uh, uh, just quickly, uh, you know, one I think is just a lot of these conversations are about trade-offs uh, and, and those trade-offs can be very difficult conversations uh, from an environmental standpoint. You know, some people might like an un unobstructed river uh, some people might like a dammed up river because it provides clean electricity. And so having those conversations about environmental trade-offs is often complicated um, and we should acknowledge those complications. I would also add that, you know, we've talked a lot about community engagement and, and respecting the rights of tribes, which I think is critically important for any process moving forward. I think we also need to be uh, cognizant of when tribes are supportive of these projects. Uh, you know, the Thacker Pass mine in Nevada, the McDermott tribe is supportive of that. Indigenous groups have been supportive of oil and gas development in Alaska, so I think it, it cuts both ways. Thank you. Dr. Motes? Thank you. I feel like I've been asked a lot of questions. I think the question that I would like to have been asked is why don't we do rare earths in the United States? And the short answer is we know where they are, we know how to get them, we know how to make the metal, so why aren't we? And that resides to many of the questions that we have here is whenever we're doing this, we will always produce waste. And that waste that comes out of rare earths is radioactive. It's the thorium. It's the elephant in the room. And so until we come up with a policy and a plan to deal with thorium, we are, not, we are going to be beholden to other countries and we're going to export our waste somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, I'm very aware of that. Uh, in fact, in uh, La Paz County, we have a uh, deposit of Scandia that has no association with thorium. So it's a, why aren't we mining? So just FYI. Mr. Mintz, your question. Thank you, Mr. Grosser. I appreciate this. I actually want to take a shot at the permitting question. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, I disagree with my dear friends here uh, sitting next to me. I believe that the average time it takes the BLM and Forest Service to permit a large hard rock mine on public lands is two years, according to the Government Accountability Office. And when you look at the mining company's own data that they annually supply to the Fraser Institute, which is a Canadian think tank that um, is supported by the mining industry, for exploration permits, the amount of time is, you know, 11 to 14 months here in the United States, you know, 8 to 10 sometimes, okay? And just quickly noting that, as we discussed, under the 1872 mining law, if you explore, you discover the valuable minerals, that's kind of the ball game. So eight to 10 months, maybe 14 months to get an exploration permit, then it's ball game under the 1872 mining law. And so that is my two cents on mine permitting reform, besides what the Congress did last time. Thank you, Mr. Coaster. Thank you, Mr. Renz. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for his question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you touched on this briefly. The question that I was uh, hoping would be asked was, what are the people, and I touched on it briefly too, uh, what are the people that live where the resources are think? They want to mine the resources, is the answer to that question. They want, and why don't we trust them? Because they want to mine them responsibly. It's their backyard. They're, not, they're, they're the ones that are going to hold the mining companies accountable to labor standards, to environmental standards. They're never going to support a mine that would not follow those. I wouldn't. Why aren't we allowed to do uh, what we know we can do? And why doesn't anybody trust the people that live in these areas is the question that I have. That's a great, great question. And one of the things that I will tell you, and particularly on the way that Arizona was admitted into the country, they were forced to take the federal doctrine. But they were actually guaranteed the multiple use doctrine aspects of public lands for the maximum to be shared. So in that aspect, it implies contract. And in that contract, it's not the federal government as last resort, it's the state so we got to start looking at this creatively. 
We had the federal government has been given way too much power. That was the exercise that happened earlier this year. We had made a speaker much too powerful. It wasn't the person, it was the position. And the correcting aspect is the 10th Amendment. Folks, it's been a great, great meeting, great conversation. And with that, uh, I adjourn this meeting. Test, 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 test.